Hi everybody, Lucas and Cynthia, and today we are talking about Nixon's lies and all of that craziness. <laughs> so I am excited for this one. This one's cool. So apparently- Wait, are you saying a politician lied? <laughs> I have to be careful what I say. I, okay, this politician lied. This guy, okay. this guy. Um, newly discovered Nixon tapes expose the lies behind marijuana's criminalization. So this is a uh, marijuana moment, uh, September 23rd, 2024. Who's the author? This was Paul Armentano, uh, deputy director of Normal. Uh, very interesting article. So I'm I'm curious how this stuff came to be, but apparently there's audio tapes that just surfaced. Uh, there's not a lot of details on sort of how they came to be, but it is interesting. It is. According to this, Richard Nixon was one of the primary architects of modern day cannabis prohibition but privately expressed skepticism of his administration's efforts to crack down on the plant and its consumers. So that's interesting. I mean- So marijuana was already illegal when when Nixon came to be. Um, Cause it was 1937 or something? Yeah, it was the tax act in, uh, is it 27 or 37? I always forget what year it was. I think it's 37. 37. And so I guess what would make this notable is that this is a precursor to marijuana being included in the Controlled Substances Act as a Schedule One. So, uh, so Nixon. So I'm going to quote the article. Uh, fast forward to 1971. That's when the Nixon administration declared drug abuse to be quote public enemy number one. The linchpin of this campaign was marijuana, which Congress had just classified as a Schedule One controlled substance, the strictest federal category. Yet privately, Nixon admitted that he did not believe that cannabis was particularly dangerous and he lamented the ridiculous penalties faced by those arrested for possessing it. Uh, it was it was my understanding that Nixon was using marijuana to go after, you know, the hippies, right? The yes. people protesting the war, the people protesting Nixon and all the, the stuff he was involved in. Uh, it was his way of going after those people and he used marijuana to do it. You're all going to jail and don't expect me to grant a pardon like that sissy Ford. Yeah, I mean, it says here, uh, he and those in his administration publicly doubled down on the supposed marijuana threat for reasons that were almost entirely political. Oh my God, politicians using people for their own perp, what? As his domestic policy chief, John Ehrlichman later acknowledged, we couldn't make it illegal to be either against the Vietnam War or black but we could get the public to associate hippies with marijuana and blacks with heroin. Now, I have heard, and I this is just, you can cut it if you want, but that the CIA actually flooded streets with drugs to divert people away from things like, you know, holding their government accountable and things like that. So I, I don't know about the veracity that, of that. Has it been proven? That's what I'm saying. I've read about it, but I've not done a deep dive. I feel dive. like I've heard about it enough times where I think there it's might be true. something there. kind of true. There's always a kernel of truth in Where there's smoke, the, there's fire. Uh-huh. And I said you introduced crack and AIDS to the ghetto. I've told you time and again that AIDS was the FBI. What I find fascinating is that, and again, we're going back in history here, but a New York Times article from 1927 had a headline, Mexican family goes insane. And they claimed a widow and her four children have been driven insane by eating the marijuana plant, according to doctors who say there is no hope of saving the children's lives and that the mother will be insane for the rest of her life. What? Well, there's a couple things there. One, <laughs> we've, we've talked about it in our past videos of the racism around marijuana and cannabis and, and the push to make it illegal. Um, you know, it goes back to even the H uh, that they use C so in this article where they quote that what's the quote that Cynthia just read they spell marijuana with an H instead of a J um, it's interesting and sort of even the racism around the spelling so that of you the say word marijuana. well they wanted it they wanted it to come across as a evil thing for Mexico and so they they actually changed the spelling at one point to give racial connotations so you know what's interesting about that is that Again, you have to look at unintended consequences, right? Sounds like a great idea with the best of intentions. What could possibly go wrong? So trying to get away from the racist spelling or pronunciation of the word 
marijuana has really fucked us in the foot because you get states like Minnesota and um, what other state? Maryland, and I'm sure there's other ones, but they start to interchangeably use cannabis to get away from marijuana, but then they include hemp Mm -hmm. And they, so then you never know if they're talking about marijuana or if they're talking about hemp. And the thing is, is like at a certain point, like logic has to prevail. I, listen, brown chick, I, you know, not going to support racism, you know, what, although people can hate me. It doesn't matter. You do yourself. I don't give a fuck. But when you talk about regulation, it's like words matter. And so we, the hemp industry, has been screwed over because so many people have attempted to remove this racist term, which I'm not arguing that it you know, was meant to be a racist term, but it has screwed us and it has screwed us over on the regulatory side because then we end up with a situation like Minnesota, for example. So Minnesota right now, 300 pages. You thought 100 pages for Georgia was a lot. Minnesota's almost 300 pages. Good Lord. Yes, and they interchangeably use cannabis, marijuana and hemp and marijuana least of any of the three, but they use them all interchangeably. So you have no idea what they're talking about. Fast forward to, to and they, that passed like two years ago. Fast forward to today where they're taking comments for how to regulate hemp and none of the regulations they want to apply to hemp apply to marijuana, but they call it cannabis. So suddenly, and I talked to a yeah, lawyer, that makes no sense. I talked to a lawyer in Minnesota who I like very much. I and, feel like you could go to court over that. Well, I, th this woman who I really like a lot, and she she's very smart. She she's from Minnesota, and even she, in our conversation, kept referring to marijuana as cannabis and hemp as hemp. And I'm like, it's all like, and I kept correct. I felt like you know what I I've seen uh, a lot of times when I'm talking to marijuana people from California, they do the same thing. They yeah. call it cannabis, and I'm like, no, 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 they no, have no. appropriated. That, that, that's not that's so not what this is. in an effort to get away from using this racist term. It's screwed us over over here. So unintended consequences. Um, so apparently Nixon was not great. <laughs> okay, but look it. So by 1937, Harry Anslinger, America's first drug czar, had successfully lobbied Congress to ban cannabis nationwide. He did so through the continuous use of racist rhetoric. There are a hundred. This 000, is a quote, by the way. This is a quote. There are 100,000 total marijuana smokers in the U.S. I don't know how they quantified that, by the way. Um, and most are Negroes, Hispanics, Filipinos, and entertainers. Oh, the next sentence is the best. Read the next sentence. They're satanic music. Since when is Menenga satanic? Um, jazz and swing result from marijuana use, he asserted. Uh... The a age of jet. Okay. I wouldn't read that last sentence. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> I, I would. I would just leave that one alone. So basically, what we have here is a political system that used people for its own political purposes. <gasps> well, it says right here. You know, they have a quote from John Ehrlichman. Uh, quote: We couldn't make it illegal to be either against the Vietnam War or black but we could, quote, get the public to associate the hippies with marijuana and blacks with heroin. So, I mean, this is, this goes back, I mean, this is, this is from the 70s, but the, the real story of marijuana goes back over 100 years and the political and racism around it and, and you know, largely without reason the this product was taken from people uh, and, and just, you know, really just tried to be banned for political reasons, for capital reasons. You know, there's, if you go back to um, the, emperor, the Emperor Wears No Clothes, right? If you go back to that book and it, it goes back and, and talks about all these different things that were done and all these horrible things that people have been put through. And then, uh, you know, you start getting into this social equity programs that some of these states are doing too. We have a video coming up on that. Which we'll talk about. Um, and then on, you know, even, even to touch on some of the other stuff, you've got, you know, a lot of states now, Texas being one of them, that don't allow convicted felons to participate in these industries. You can't get a license as a convicted felon. Why, yeah, we'll talk why about not? that in the other video. I mean, don't, if you've done your time, right, and, you know, you want to be in an industry and you want to do something around cannabis. I don't understand why that's an issue. Save your outrage for the other video. I think the takeaway from this is that 
You should never believe a government narrative. You should question everything. Every time somebody says you should do this, do your research. Do your research and question everything. What is the thing? What does the sticker say? Be ungovernable. You should question everything because we are used every day. There's puppeteers, there's people, there's administrations. Well, the funny stuff about this too is this was, you know, 50 years ago now, these quotes that they're talking about. And they're like, oh, this just came out, right? Um, and, and nothing against the author. I, I think it's very appropriate to discuss this. But the fact that this is just coming out uh, and, you know, 50 years later is kind of wild. Well, okay. So this is where the conspiracy part of my mind like goes to work. So again, question everything, believe nothing, right? Because you have to question everything. Um, I want to believe, I'm like, I'm like uh, Mulder. Um, there's this whole push to reschedule marijuana and all of a sudden this is discovered. Coincidence? Right. <laughs> It's a valid everything. point. It's a valid point. Question everything. Um, you know, and, and the people behind the attempted rescheduling are some of the most dangerous, dangerous industries and dangerous people on the planet, Big Pharma. Yeah. And so all of a sudden this is discovered. You're trying to tell me that in 50 years nobody had access to this. But now when we're talking rescheduling and Surprise! People, people are unhappy that it's been pushed back and all that other stuff. Um yeah, you have to you have to question the motives behind a lot Correct. of this stuff. So don't believe anything you see on TV. Do your research. Trust but verify. You don't even have to trust. Honestly, I think I feel like our news media has er and our political system has eroded to such a point that you shouldn't trust anything. <laughs> nope. Yeah. So same goes for here, and it can cut either way. So anyway, um, Nixon probably didn't care about marijuana, but he did have another agenda, like they always do. Always, always. Thank you for joining us as always. We'll have a link to the full article in the description. Lucas and Cynthia with Hometown Hero. Happy hunting. We'll see you soon. mother will be insane for the rest of her life. Meanwhile, two days later, she like sobers up. <laughs> She's like, let me out. <laughs>